Well, this is our fabulous favourite few good women segment, which everybody loves. Why do they love it? Because it's all about testifying and giving a testimony of the goodness of God in our lives. It's all about giving glory to him in the journey that we've walked with him thus far. And this is just a snapshot of these women's journeys, but here we go. So I'd like to call up um, all of them and let's clap after they all come up. So I'd like Karina Hunt to come up. Karina gave a heart to Jesus at six years old. She's been married to Roger for 10 years this September and they have a beautiful seven-year-old, Eleora. Karina has had to face the challenges of dyslexia and social anxiety. Next we have Florinda Williams. Florinda has been walking, come on up Florinda, walking with Jesus for 31 years. She's a single mum with three girls and a boy, two teens and two tweens. And Florinda has faced major life challenges including the salvation of her husband, his passing and living life without him. Joey Moody is the next lady and Joey, we all know her as Joey. <laughs> I didn't even know your name was Joanne. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> has been walking with Jesus since she was nine. She's been married to Michael for 50 years. They've had seven children, 19 grandchildren and one great grandchild. It's been passed around all through conference. It's lovely. She's had to face the pain of losing a teenage daughter and a child's divorce. And the last lady is Irene Pass. If you could come up, Irene. Irene has been following Jesus for 22 years. She's been married to John for 19. She has two daughters, a son-in-law and four stepchildren. Irene has had to overcome many obst obstacles, including growing up in a foster care the breakdown of a marriage and battling cancer. So I'm going to uh, oh, so let's clap for these courageous women. So courageous. And we're, we're going to start with Karina. So come on up, Karina. Bless you. Yes. Morning. <laughs> um, or afternoon, actually. Just please forgive me because this is not my comfort zone at all. <laughs> okay. Um, I grew up in a Christian family, so I was surrounded by God and the church from the very beginning. I was raised in a Christian home. Um, my, my walk with God started um, when I was six years old, right here actually. Um, and as Pastor Ivan prayed for me, I knew, <laughs> I knew instantly that God had wrapped his arms around me and said, you are mine, you are loved. Um, but the journey is not always easy. It is one of many different seasons of um, learning and growing and maturing in him. Um, I would say that um, my testimony is one of holding on and staying steadfast to God and holding on to his promises for my life. Um, in my Christian journey, I had to overcome challenges of... Sorry. <laughs> um, schooling with dyslexia. Bullying and social anxiety. Um, my identity was crushed and I struggled with learning and the fear of being hum humiliated. Um, sorry. Um, for my lack of understanding, I made sure I didn't ask too many questions. I faded very well into the background of school, of youth, of church and even my family. Um, as much as I long to learn more about God um, and be all he created me to be, I really struggled with learning and reading his word and joining in with Bible study groups and courses held at church because of my dyslexia. Um, 
it was very hard for me to um, comprehend the content and I would get lost very easily. Um, this in turn made it hard for me to be a part of conversations and discussions and because of my anxiety, I avoided situations where I had to meet new people. Anything involving large groups would leave me feeling very overwhelmed and depleted. Um, that I was too inadequate to be used by God and I remember many nights crying myself to sleep. I had, I had got so caught up in the lie that the enemy had weaved into my life that I thought I needed to be smart in order to be accepted by people and fit in. That I needed to know and understand everything to have a positive and productive um, faith and to be able um, to help people. I desperately wanted to be a good witness of God's love and compassion and even in our faith walk, the enemy is out to destroy our God potential. <clears throat> but God always had his hand on me. He knew what I needed. As I reflect back, I can see that in the different seasons of my faith journey, that God has placed positive family members, godly friendships, and mentors in my life that have supported me, accepted me, and encouraged me to be myself the way God created me to be. They helped me to grow and be a part of the family of God. And I thank God that he placed those steadfast, bold, and courageous people in my life, allowing me to grow and be a blessing to others. <clears throat> As a young adult, um, God poured into my heart on a greater level. I really felt him take a hold of me in a lot tighter and I knew I had to let go of some wrong thought patterns in my life. Excuse me. Um, to make room for new fruitful growth in my life. I started pressing more into spending time with him and allowing him to show and teach me in a way he wanted me to understand and apply to my life. I started soaking more in his presence and building a more vibrant relationship with him. And then I was able to learn and understand what he wanted for my life and not what I thought I needed <clears throat> for my life. <clears throat> um, he did a real number on my self-esteem and rebuilt it to be God esteem. I've, I felt him saying to step out of the shadows and into his light. I realised that I became someone that I was not created to be that I needed to stop looking at all my faults and focusing on the things I disliked about myself and look at developing my strengths and talents he had given me and allow him to use those things for his glory. God revealed a psalm to me at this time and it is imprinted on my heart. I would like to share a part of Psalm 139 with you. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, O oh Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. 
I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To tr- to, sorry. to you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand, and when I wake up, you are still with me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out everything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God has opened doors for me to be a vessel of his love to others. Things I thought, things I never thought I could do. But as your word says in, as his word says in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. My future is bright and there is still a journey ahead and things to face in my life. But what God has done in my life is amazing. I was able to study and receive my diploma of early childhood education and care. (laughs) Um, And now have been very honored and blessed to be working at Heights College for the last 15 years as a teacher aide. I have traveled overseas on missions trips to take Bibles in to spread his word and now happily married, and we have been blessed with a beautiful daughter. In God, we lack nothing. He knows our hearts and thought, our hearts' desires and thoughts. There are many ways to be a positive and functioning part of the family of God. Despite our disabilities and insecurities, God's word has never failed, and it never will. Sometimes God makes us wait. He has something special planned for us. You can trust his timing because if he gave you a promise, he intends to follow through no matter how long it takes. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. He was deliberate and intentional. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Bold one. Florinda's next. Come on up, Florinda. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I texted Pastor Chris that, uh, Pastor Chris, please don't call me first. I'd rather be in the middle or be the last. (laughs) So, which is good. (laughs) Um, Praise God. It's God's grace that I'm sharing here to you how God works in my life. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. We don't have much. Growing up with full of insecurity and doubt. One problem that I struggle, knowing that I am an unwanted child. Because when I was a young child, I find out that my mom aborted me a 
couple of times. But because of God's plan in my life, here I am, fearfully, wonderfully made. Psalms 139, verse 14. When I was in high school, I found Jesus. Because of my brother, I see how God changed him from a violent person always in trouble to a pastor. God used me to invite my classmates and friends in our Bible studies and share to them. Because of that Bible study, one of my classmates became a pastor. As I continued serving the Lord, my brother and my pastor always remind me not to be unequally yoked together with unbeliever. But because of my stubbornness, I didn't listen. I marry an unbeliever. Though I face the consequences because we argue in our faith, I continued to pursue God, believing that my husband will be saved. I lay my hands on his pillow, pray for his salvation. I do it when he isn't there, just in case he wake up and I'll be in trouble. <laughs> and I believe that God had a purpose in my life to win my husband for the Lord. Even I didn't see it yet because it's God's will that my husband will be saved. Coming to church, 45 minutes drive, when we are in the car, I always say to the kids, always pray for dad's salvation. We, we claim God's word that as for me and my house will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, 15. Every night, the kids and I pray together for the salvation of their dad. And I, for 17 years, 17 years, it's a big, it's a big cup. It's a big, really. For 17 years, I've been praying for my husband's salvation. It's a lesson to those who are single, searching for, wait for the right time. Wait for the one that God, God knows what's best. Well, God is so faithful. He answered our prayer. In February 2020, he was saved. Yes. Hallelujah. Radically changed, baptized by the Holy Spirit and water baptism. Yeah. In that year, we are facing a big challenge. He was diagnosed of a lung cancer. But in the trials, I see the peace of God upon us because my husband is saved and changed. The Bible study started in our house. He was so hungry for the Lord, for the word of God, that he asked Pastor Ivan to come back all the time. One week in his walk with the Lord, one week, he got rid of all his Easy DC CD collection. Yeah. And all the things that wasn't pleasing to God. During the first cycle of the treatment, the cancer was controlled. It came back, but it came back. We fight the good fight of faith, asking God not to take him yet. Because the kids were still young. And our journey to the Lord together is just started. But for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways. My ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. 
and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55 verse 8 to 9. And 20 of January 2021, my husband went with the Lord. God is so faithful, so good. He provides. We connect to the right people. Though some people say, how I'm going to do it with four kids. But I look up to God where my strength come from. Psalms 37 verse 25. Once I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The pain and separation I feel, I'm still facing it. Nights that I couldn't sleep, I asked the Holy Spirit to give me strength. And I asked God to remind me that one day, the kids and I will see their dad again. Thank you. Oh my God. Thank you, Florinda. And next we have Joey Moody. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Michelle, I just want to say before I begin, I found one of those shirts for my husband. <laughs> Used to go to the second-hand shop, um, Vinnie's down in Gympie, when we first married, I only had a few kids. And uh, I saw this lovely paisley print body shirt that I thought would look great on my husband. So I took it home and washed it. <laughs> and he dutifully put it on. And he stood in front of the mirror before he went to church. He was on communion that day. <laughs> and he came in to me and he said, honey, I can't wear this shirt. <laughs> It's a great shirt. He said, love, it's covered with naked ladies. <laughs> so that's my story. <laughs> and I so got you this morning. <laughs> so good afternoon, beautiful ladies. I feel so blessed to be here this afternoon and call this church my home. This time last year at Beautiful, we were waiting for our house to be sold. And I got... Uh, word from my husband on the very day that we were sitting here on the Saturday morning to say it would be sold. I had walked out and I said, you know, this house is going to be sold when I go up to Rocky and sure enough it did. <laughs> and so here we are. We've been, my husband and Mike, we moved here 10 months ago and, but we have been visiting this church for over 27 years. Uh, for as long as Alana, however old Alana is, and uh, to visit our children, Melissa and Greg, and gradually they all moved up. I've been married to Mike for over 50 years. We have seven children, yeah, 19 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. I was born in Kingaroy, the eldest of six children. I have many fond memories of my childhood, music, dancing, laughter, dancing with Dad in the lounge room, the record on, and we went for it. We were loved by Dad and Mum, but our family did not know Jesus. But Jesus knew our family, and he had a plan. <laughs> when I was about seven years old, I had a seizure while kneeling on a chair washing up. I was taken to Brisbane for an appointment with the doctors, and they diagnosed me with epilepsy. This was a shock to my parents, as they had, there'd been no epilepsy in the family. But in my case, it was caused from brain injury at birth uh, from, during a high forceps delivery. In those days, there was such a stigma attached to epilepsy. Children at school would tease relentlessly and even some teachers were unkind and just plain mean. And I had to forgive them when I grew up. I found school to be difficult during those years. As a child, the only holiday of note that I remember was when I was about nine years old. Mum and Dad never had a lot of money. My uncle drove us, they never had a car, <laughs> drove us to Harvey Bay for a holiday. And in those days, one could have six children lined up the back seat with no seat belts. It was great. <laughs> we could even hang out the windows. <laughs> 
Um, whilst on holidays on the beach that year in 1962 was a Scripture Union beach mission camp run by various people who gave up their time to witness to children on the beach. There was so much fun, activities, prizes, singing, stories. Uh, the most wonderful story I heard was that Jesus loved me and he died for me. Uh, it did not matter that I was a child from a large family with not a lot of money. Back then there was a stigma um, attached to uh, families that had a lot of children. In our street, um, there were three houses. There were 18 children in the three streets. There was a stigma. There still could be a stigma attached today if you let it attach itself to you. It did not matter that I was a child, had epilepsy. Uh, he loved me and he loved my family. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. We heard John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Now, that is the most famous scripture, nearly everybody can quote it. Matthew 19.14, let the little children come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Three of my siblings and I gave our hearts to Jesus on that beach. One of the most amazing aspects is that one of those teachers who gave up his time to witness to all of those children became one of my parents' best friends in later life. And not only that, but our daughter Sarah married his grandson. Yeah. Mum and Dad were wonderful parents, but they didn't know God. When we arrived home from that holiday, we asked Mum if we could go to church in Little Kilkeven. Mum came as well and she was saved. I loved church. I loved God. He, it just made sense to me why I was here. Now, I was a church girl that was crazy because of that stigma, so they called me crazy. I wasn't, but when I started going to church, I had a new nickname. They called me Churchy. <laughs> but I didn't let it faze me. <laughs> when I was about 13 years old, a canon Jim Glennon was visiting an Anglican church in the town. He was then identified as a charismatic, I'd never heard of a charismatic, believing in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who had the ministry of healing. Mum took me to see him, he prayed for me, he encouraged me, he anointed me with oil, and I was completely healed. <laughs> By his stripes, Jesus had healed me. The word said it, so I was healed. Now, I had to fight for that. Because the enemy would come and say, of course you haven't been healed. You were getting better. I'd turn around and say, hey, listen here to me. <laughs> you wouldn't be giving me such a hard time. <laughs> and I had to do that often. We continue to grow in the knowledge of God. I believe we love my dad into the kingdom of God. And at a Billy Graham crusade in Brisbane in 1969, my dad gave his heart to the Lord. Dad died in 2018, having lived a full life, loving God and his family. So our whole family was saved. The family moved to Gympie when I began my nursing, and that's when I met Mike at a Methodist church. Now, I told him he had to come to the Methodist church to find me. <laughs> a gorgeous, handsome man with red hair and a motorbike. Now, you wouldn't know he had red hair, but he did. <laughs> At this time, his dad was the pastor of the AG Church in Gympie. We were married in the AG Church in January 1973. Our first baby girl arrived Christmas Day, 73. So the only holiday we'd had was our honeymoon. <laughs> it was, must have been pretty good. <laughs> uh, even though Mike and I were both Christians... Our upbringing as children was as different as chalk and cheese. Mike came from a very strict Christian home. Um, upbringing, whereas my family was more relaxed. Now, we were relaxed, but he still had to ask Dad if he could take me out. And really, the only reason he ever got out with me was because he was a pastor's son, so that was all right. <laughs> At times, this wasn't easy when we were married. We had to make a path and a culture of our own for our own children. 
Psalm 128 verse 3 says, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. And that I was. We were blessed with seven. (laughs) When Greg started going out with Melissa, um, the table was full. It was the biggest table we had in the house. And Mike looked over at me and he said, Love, I feel there's somebody missing from the table. And I said, What do you mean? (laughs) There's no more room. (laughs) And would you believe I felt pregnant with Hannah? I thought it was a, must have been a premonition or something. When we brought her home, uh, she was in the bouncer on the floor at the table there. And I said to Mike, Now tell me, love, are we all here? He said, Yes, we're here. Angela Joy was our third baby, uh, full of life, athletic, female drummer who loved God, her family and friends. She went to school for the social aspect of fun and sharing Jesus. She didn't bother about the schoolwork. (laughs) On the 21st of July 1997, our life changed forever. As a family, it changed forever. Our daughter Angela was killed in a car accident with her friend Esther at the age of 17. Nothing prepares a person or a family for a shock like that. I remember where I was when I was told that the police wanted to see us. That's 26 years ago and it's as vivid to me today as it was then. I had a Christian lady come up to me a few weeks later. Lovely lady and asked me if I was over it. I tell you, I could have hit her. (laughs) I said, I carried her for nine months. I've had her for 17 and a half years. I will not be over her in a few weeks. I will never be over her. Um, She's part of our life. In the beginning of my journey in grief, I had seven good reasons to get up of a morning. That's what woke me up. I had to get up. When they told me that she died that night, I was so sick, I couldn't stop vomiting. It was like, it was like I had morning sickness. Uh, the shock was incredible. My husband and my six children were the reason I got up. Each day was a step and they were important. There was a large void left by the one who wasn't there. And our other six children, all of different ages, were grieving the loss of their sister. Now, I could go to each of them, you could go to each of them and ask them, where were they when they were told that their sister had died? Every one of them would remember. We loved God. We'd prayed, we were part of the church all our life, we prayed for his protection over our family. One stage, on one occasion, we actually nearly went over a cliff. It wasn't really a cliff, but, you know, and God had saved us. I never imagined that this could happen to my family. Family and church friends, church family supported us in ways that they could, but they felt helpless Some people shared condolences and even though they were trying to comfort our family, she is in a better place and she was, but that wasn't the point. I would have rathered her be here. I even said to my husband one day, I would be prepared to look after her for the rest of my life. He put his arm around me and said, Honey, do you think our athletic little girl would have ever wanted to be in a bed? No. She wouldn't have. Ultimately, it was only God who could give us the source of comfort that we needed. He never let us go. His love toward us has remained faithful. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Luke 7, 12, 13, we read about the widow who lost her son. Jesus saw her. He had compassion on her and he wept. Jesus wept when he saw Lazarus had died. Jesus understood our grief. My favourite, most comforting scripture still is Psalm 139 verse 16. 
Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, as when as yet there were none of them. We were taken by surprise, but God wasn't. It doesn't mean that this journey of grief has been any less difficult. Um, but there was great comfort in knowing that our daughter loved the Lord and we know where she is. Our grief has been a price of our love for her. We have inscribed on her headstone two scriptures, 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, I have not seen nor heard or even entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Mike whispered to me one day, not long after Angie died, Joey, we have one home safe. And as a mother and a father, the greatest thing we can do for our children is to see them saved and for them to walk with Jesus because when we get to heaven, that's the only thing that we have down here, <laughs> little persons that we have down here, that we can actually take with us. One day there will be rejoicing in heaven when we all see Jesus. Each day, year and years, has been a journey towards healing. I've had the opportunity to speak and listen to others who have lost a child. Prior to Angie dying, I had no idea. I was ignorant. You know, you expect older people to die. You don't expect a young person to die. I had no understanding of the loss associated with losing a child or a loved one. Some haven't had their child for as long as we had Angela. Some lose their only child. Or others lose several children at a time. Others lose a child whom they have never had the privilege of knowing. Some families lose a wife, a husband, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, a granddad, a grandmother and friends. All losses of loved ones are painful. Through our experience of grief, I've been able to share the comfort that only God can give. And even though we still shed tears, our hearts are glad and full. This morning, Paul came over and um, I just said to him, So, honey, he was out in Mount Isa when Angie died. I said, So, honey, where were you? Um, what were you doing when you were told that Angela had died? Within minutes, seconds, both of us were crying. <laughs> I had the makeup running off my face. <laughs> um, but we are thankful to God for the blessings of our seven fabulous children. Our wonderful daughter in law, our sons in law, our amazing grandchildren, and our most recent blessing, little Harry James. We are now looking forward to the next chapter in our lives here in Rockhampton. Great excitement, spending time and being involved with our family and our new church family. Thank you. Now we have Irene. Bless you, Irene. Good afternoon, beautiful ladies. If there's one thing that I'm hoping my testimony leaves you with today... It's that there are no victims in the kingdom. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I've noticed there's a very dangerous shift in our culture to the language of victimhood. Even the word survivor denotes barely hanging in there. But the transformative power of Christ's love turns us from victims to victors. And that's the lens that I'd like you to see my journey through, not as a victim, but as a victor in Christ Jesus who loves me. So I was born in 1971, fatherless, and at that time that was a source of great shame. 
I was an illegitimate child and my mother was a paranoid schizophrenic. At the age of 10, my grandparents gained custody of me. Before that, my life consisted of being in the care of foster homes, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and with my mum. Every three months or so, my mum would pack my things, march to a phone box with me in tow to ring a family member and say, come and get her, or I'm putting her in a home. A few months later, she'd always want me back. Whenever I do child protection training at work, I do a mental checklist of all the types of abuse that I experienced. I was in a family full of strongholds, alcoholism, violence, sexual abuse. To give you a gauge of the level of abuse that I'm talking about, um, my three-month-old brother, my mother killed him um, when I was very young. And my younger sister, four years younger than me, she's still in the care of the public trust today. She's never been able to live independently. The other thing I will say is that vulnerable children also attract predators. We're like a moth to a flame. It's like they see. But you know, in all of that, I still see God's hand in my journey. I see him placing people in my path that literally saved my life. And he gifted me in ways that gave me a future and a hope. I could read by the age of three. Um, I don't remember ever being taught how to read. But it was that through all the broken schooling that I had, reading was my go-to. Um, so even though I had all the, those gaps in my learning, I had that. That was his gift to me, to give me a future. At 16, I moved to Brisbane and I began my first de facto relationship um, with my boyfriend, Andrew. He came from a lovely family. He was studying at uni and he was stable. Never could quite figure out what, what he wanted with me. I was so broken. The next two years of my life was so wonderful. His parents treated me like a daughter. On the 13th of December, 1989, Andrew was working as a surveyor's chainman um, in our uni holidays and he was caught in a trench collapse on a building site. And my world collapsed right along with that trench. After four days, the life support was turned off. The best picture of me for the next five years, I was Forrest Gump and I was running. <laughs> I tried to escape the grief and the loss and I found myself involved in things which caused me great harm, emotionally, physically. My running came to a grinding halt when I met my first husband, Jim. You know, I don't know that two more broken people could have found each other. <laughs> I really don't. For someone who'd seen a lot of the unseemly side of life, you'd think I'd be a bit untrusting. But I was really naive, which sounds really weird. I remember learning the truth about Jim when a debt collector came to repossess the car. He ended up sitting my heavily pregnant frame down in the kitchen to make me a cup of tea and breaking the news to me that my husband was a gambling addict. Two weeks later, I birthed my first baby, Amarina. And unable to breastfeed, I had to beg my mother-in-law for money for bottles and formula. It was a deep sense of shame. You know you're at your lowest ebb when you can't even afford sanitary products and you need to improvise with toilet paper and glad wrap to go to work. I say that to give you a perspective of just what it's like to live with a person in the grip of a gambling addiction. So why did, I st why did I stay? My only expectation of my husband was that he didn't beat me. I didn't have any more value or expectations than that. 
Eight weeks after the birth of my second daughter, Alandra, Jim had left us for two weeks while he went to Sydney. I had one dollar in my purse, but there was food in the fridge. There was a knock at the door and six plainclothes detectives with guns on hips enacted a search warrant. My house was turned upside down and my hands shook for days. I realised I could not allow my girls to be raised like that. I asked the neighbour to use her phone to ring my parents-in-law and beg for $10 to be able to go to Centrelink on the bus the next day to apply for a single parent pension. I was on maternity leave. And then I used my last dollar at a payphone to tell my husband he had to pack his things when he returned. I would give him 12 months to stop gambling. The picture that emerged when he left was seven weeks of unpaid rent, debt all over town, and I had to apply for an emergency grant from my superannuation payments to meet those debts. It turned out Jim had been getting ready to go to work, but in fact had lost his job uh, many months before. My ex-parents-in-law were salvos, and they used to invite me to various things at church, and one night in October, a visiting preacher's wife gave a testimony. Unlike me, she had a beautiful life. No trauma or tragedy. It was just this most perfect life, her family of origin, her husband. And I thought, if this woman, with her perfect life, needs a saviour, how much more do I need a saviour? And I gave my heart to Jesus that night. Did that mean an end to trial? <laughs> Not on your Nelly. <laughs> but for the first time in my life, I was not a victim who crumbled, nor was I a survivor who had to fight and claw. Sorry. A month after my commitment to Christ, I was diagnosed with stage 3 melanoma. Post-surgery, I had three monthly full-body CT scans with dye to check for spread of cancer to my liver, lungs and brain. Twelve months later, they found a cricket ball-sized tumour in the centre of my chest, which had caused a stroke. I remember the afternoon I found out, and I can't tell you what it's like to be a single mum and told your condition is terminal especially having nobody except Jim to leave my girls to. I remember being on the phone begging him, crying, please, you've got to stop gambling. You need to raise these girls. The best metaphor I have for that time is like being a cat in a bathtub full of water and the sides are really slippery. <laughs> the next day, a friend from Scripture Union Chaplaincy asked if he could come and pray with me. The man prayed with me for hours in the spirit and the panic was replaced by complete peace. Someone at church said I was glowing which surprised them completely considering they all knew that I was about to go down to Brisbane for surgery. That peace stayed with me when I knelt before the altar of the church and submitted my children to God with no conditions. It's hard to describe that level of peace, but it came with complete surrender to his will, not my will, I had no power of my own, absolutely none. My very breath depended on him. But I knew he loved me and I knew he loved my girls and I trusted him. Sorry. That peace stayed with me when I kissed the precious cheeks of my daughters goodbye the morning of my surgery and handed them over to their father. The surgeon had told me I may not make it off the table as the tumour was caught up in my aorta, which had caused the stroke. And if the surgeon had nicked the aorta, he may not have time to crack the chest and get a patch on it 
before I bled out. Still I had perfect peace in Christ Jesus. That peace stayed with me as I was wheeled into the theatre for what was then very experimental surgery using robot hands, lasers and cameras through my back. Post-surgery, uh, the hospital chaplain, Jenny, who'd been praying with me prior to the surgery and wheeled me down to theatre, arrived just as visiting hours were closing and said that she'd been standing at her sink washing up when God called, told her very clearly to come and see me. <laughs> the surgeon's intern arrived at the same time and I asked her could she just go and check my results from the biopsy. She replied that she would, although Dr Matar, the surgeon, had done hundreds of surgeries and I was told that the tumour was black and most certainly the spread of my melanoma. They were 100% sure even without the test results. Minutes later, she came back shaking her head and telling me she couldn't believe it. My tumour was benign, not cancerous. <sighs> I had said all through that time, I'm not a statistic to God. That was my mantra and people looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> When people say God is light, he is light. It was as if the whole room lit up with this fluorescent light. And Jenny the chaplain, who'd clearly been brought there as a witness, we just began praying prayers of thanks. We were all told, oh, sorry, then a Christian nurse came in and she said, this is a miracle. We were all told you'd be dead within months and you were alone with two little girls. Well, that's 20 years ago this year. <laughs> and I've raised those precious girls that are here today and I have a son in love as well he wasn't invited <laughs> although he is beautiful and both of them think I did an alright job as a mama and Marina is a diplomat and an international lawyer and Alandra is a registered nurse I'm 19 years into a marriage to a man who treats me like a princess every day. And we met as a result of my illness. And that's a love story I never thought I would have. I also get to teach here at Heights College, helping to shape the lives of young people and to tell them that victory is available to those who love Jesus. We are not victims. I can say in Christ Jesus, I have the victory. We are not survivors. The victory is in the love of Jesus Christ. We're overcomers because he has won the victory, not us, him. We walk in blessing because of the work that was done for us at Calvary. I'm going to leave you with words that are far better at conveying truth than mine ever will be. From Romans 8, verses 35 to 37 paraphrased who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us thanks thank you oh how awesome were those testimonies? How does that impact your faith? This is, we're better together, aren't we? So much better together and all for the glory of God. Well, ladies, that's it for this afternoon.